Welcome everybody to this episode of Engage with E-Commerce. Uh, know your audience and get them to your website. Um, we're really excited to have uh, Rebecca Johns from Argent Social here. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself, Rebecca? Hello, uh, as Eloise says, I am Rebecca. Um, I'm a marketing strategist and what that actually means is that I help businesses get clear on how they're going to take their offerings to market on digital platforms, mostly social. So it's about, it's all about how do you talk about your business and your products uh, on social in a way that's going to move you towards your goals. Awesome. Thanks for that, Rebecca. I'm Eloise. Um, I'm CEO of Sell Beyond. We help brands grow on Amazon in French, German, Spanish, Italian, Dutch and English. Nathan. Hello, I'm Nathan Lomax, co-founder of Quickfire Digital. We're an e-commerce focused digital transformation agency. We help brands maximize efficiency, profitability and scalability through the use of tech. Awesome. And you take it away. I think you're the presenter this morning, Nathan. Thank you. Yes, I am. So I'm going to share my PowerPoint and then off we go. So we've got tons of stuff to go through this morning. And firstly, Rebecca, I can't thank you enough for your time joining us this morning. It's my pleasure. A quick recap of, well, a quick kind of summary of today's session. We're going to go through who is the audience and what do they care about? We're going to look, about, uh, we're going to look at self-reference bias um, and then kind of trying to get us to get in the shoes of our customers. It's a bit, um, yeah, I hear that all the time, right? Oh, okay, yeah, you've got to think in the eyes of customers, but too many people just think about themselves and they can't do that. So it'd be great to break that down a bit more. We're going to start defining some avatars and go through the process of how you would define an avatar. And that's not the little blue things you see on the movies. That's essentially the, um, yeah, the, the kind of what we imagine our customers to look like and how they behave. We're then going to talk about identifying and understanding all of the audiences, not just the one audience. There's obviously plenty of affinity and lookalike audiences that come off the back of that. And then finally, hopefully, we'll have some time to do a bit of a live exercise so we can bring all this to life and, and show people a real world example. So important to mention before we start, obviously, you're a specialist in the B2C space. And Eloise and I normally will do more in the B2B space. So it's going to be lovely to kind of cross-reference different tactics and tricks and say, okay, well, this is how we do it. These are the tools we use. Oh, we use something similar. Um, yeah, really looking forward to that. So let's dive in. The first thing we're going to go through, uh, before we start, actually, a little bit of housekeeping. This is normally um, deck or Ant, whatever one you are, Eloise. This is, uh, <laughs> this is your bit. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Anyone who is on the webinar and when the Zoom closes, uh, you can opt into getting a free strategy review with um, Nathan on your website, an Amazon strategy review with me. Uh, Rebecca's got um, a walkthrough of how to create your own marketing avatars. You put your name in, we'll email that to you over to you as well. And that'll come as soon as you close the Zoom, there'll be a pop-up asking you to fill in the form. We'd love to hear your feedback. She's so good at it now, after all these webinars, she's uh, the pro. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to start with who's the audience and what do they care about? Too many times people think that we're building campaigns, websites, Amazon landing pages, whatever it is, we're building it for them, but actually we're not. We need to forget about ourselves for a moment and start thinking about who it is, our customers and how we're going to reach them. So the first thing I want to talk to you about, Rebecca, really is about how we cut through the noise and become relevant. Mm. In terms of when you're identifying an audience, what's the process that you go through? So I think... I think the, the, the crucial thing to understand is that this isn't anything new, really. It's, it's always been important to have, you know, the, the audience at the heart of what you do in your marketing. But I think that's just been magnified by digital because everybody's attention spans are very short. You're competing with people's attention, uh, for people's attention, not just with other brands, but with their mates uh influencers celebrities depending on what platform they're on at the time but also where they physically are when they're reading your post or your email or whatever comms method you're using um and so the more dialed in you can make your marketing to that audience the quicker you're going to get their attention and be able to hold it for the time it takes to quickly get across your message that what you've got is for them um and i think when I'm working with a business on this, I always start with, with the big audience. So although I do a lot of B2C now, 20, I've been doing this for 25 years and for the first 20 years, I just did B2B. So I, I, really, I really understand where you guys are coming from in terms of B2B. And the first time I looked at doing this exercise for a B2C brand, it just felt really mental. It was 
felt like this completely woo-woo thing, like somebody was asking me to do a drum workshop where I was going to find my spirit animal because I was so used to dealing with kind of target demographics and target market, these big groups of people that suddenly being asked to think about one individual or three separate individuals, just it just felt completely wacky. Um, but very often I'll start with what information a business has about their audiences in a macro sense. So what does, you know, who do they generally target? what kinds of people, what types of people. So we talk about the broad first, and then we then we bring that kind of diamond from the broad into the narrow and start pulling out individuals um, and really defining them at a very detailed level to the point where the first time I did it, I felt like I'd written novel outlines. And I thought, well, if I screw this job up, I've got a novel in These Three Women Go to Iceland because it was for a, a tour company um, that did tours in Iceland um, because I knew all three of them so well having written these very, very detailed use personas. And I don't know if we necessarily need to go into that, that deep level of detail, but you do need a lot more detail than I think people initially assume. For sure. And, and when I'm looking at it, I'm starting to think, okay, well, not only do we need to understand the kind of top level, but then we need to drill down. So not just demographics, but psychographic, their interests, mm. uh, they're kind of where they're hanging out and all that good stuff. Where would you start? Again, I'm looking at a couple of people on, on today's show and I'm thinking, okay, where do you start as a beta? If your product's B2C and you're looking, okay, let's say you sell, uh, you're in the fashion space. Yep. Where would you start creating an avatar? Um, it's, oh, it's a bit of an it depends thing. If you've ever sold directly to somebody, if you've ever met a customer, that's always a great place to start. So I always have people base user personas on either people they've already sold to or people that they know. Obviously for like, I did this exercise for a and b in Brixham and that was really, really easy for them because everybody they sell to lives with them for four days. So they were able to go, we just want more customers like John and then we break down what who John was and what he looked like and what his pain points were and what his motivations were. Easy peasy. For someone who sells t-shirts over, over the web, a little bit harder. And then really what we start to do there is we might think about somebody you know who is the kind of person that buys your t-shirt, which is why very often when I'm looking at campaign plans, either me or my husband or my sister or my mates appear in people's campaign plans because I've based a user persona around someone I know. And that's really just to give them a bit of shape and complexity. But it, it, you know, very often it is a fictional exercise for people who don't meet their customers. You know, you're thinking about, oh, I've got that mate CV and she's always buying band t-shirts from Facebook. So I'm gonna base a user persona on her and then change details about her that don't quite fit the sort of person I know will buy from me. And I guess, Eloise, in your line of work, it would be similar in terms of when you're running campaigns, do you go through that kind of thing with your customers? Um, I certainly do. I did want to do a screen share of ways you can do it on Amazon where it is super anonymized. I'm not sure if I've got permission to screen share. Nathan, you might have to give me that power. Here we are. Try that. Awesome. Because there's one thing that we can do on Amazon where a lot of us don't, even know who our customer are and can meet them. Oh, that's me screen sharing here. Yeah. So on any Amazon page, you'll often find this is a lawnmower. You can get customers who view this item also viewed. That's a proxy way of trying to find out who on earth is actually looking at your page because you may or may not get the data. And you'll also found, find um, what a customer's buy after viewing this item. So that's a way of doing a bit of detective work um, for types of interest people might have, obviously lawnmowers, but did we know that um, Customers also bought goals by inspirational stories. So the type of man that buys a lawnmower is a man with a challenge. There's the, the, I'll, give you, I'll just give you that for out there. Um, and, and again, with um, this particular non-alcohol, you will see the other brands that have affinity with this particular brand page. And that's really, really helpful for customers, then, for people that are trying to do this type of research from zero or that might have wonder whether their Amazon customer is the same as a customer that really knows their brand because often they're different. You can do a very similar thing in the, um, in the audiences section for Facebook ads. So as, you know, as everybody knows, Facebook collects a really terrifying amount of data. Um, so you can look at your current audience on Facebook if you have one 
and see what other brands they're interested in. Sometimes that can be really useful for defining audiences if, if you know, if you built your audience in a in a kind of best practice way. Uh, sometimes it's not very indicative because a lot of people grow their Facebook following initially from, say, their mates or um, they ask friends and family to follow their page. And so the, you know, the data that comes out the back of that might not be as indicative of what your target audience is interested in. But it might give you a few kind of starters for yeah. 10. Oh, there look quite a lot of people like these brands or there maybe that are more similar. Yeah. I mean, it's always, I, I kind of feel with user personas when you're dealing with not much data yet. So your website's very new, maybe you don't have social platforms yet, or they've not been running very long, or they've not been built in a particularly best practice way. Your following is maybe a bit full of mates or whatever. Um, what you can do is this slightly fictional exercise where you make, you know, you, you create these avatars. And what you're doing is making an assumption that you're then going to test. Because certainly in my space in social, you get data immediately on whether what you're doing is resonating with your audience or not. Within like hours, you can see whether people are responding to the kind of content that you put out. So initially you're always taking a bit of a flyer and then testing and refining. Um, if you've been in operation a bit longer and you've got Google Analytics or other analytics on your website, or you've got decent data coming in through Facebook, or you've got Amazon data, you, you can probably build a bit more of a data-driven picture but ultimately it is always going to and i think that's why for me when i first did this exercise it felt so woo woo is because you are always taking a little bit of a flyer it yeah. is it, it is always a bit like writing a story it's always based on your mum or your nan or yeah your and i'm a i'm a super scientific person i like evidence i like data i like testing but and so it was a real leap of faith for me the first you know the first couple of times i did it but now if I try and do any of my job for a business without user personas, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work in the same way. So um, that's, a, that's a really good shout. And one thing, I'd, if I just quickly share this analytics, you quite rightly identified that if you've got enough data, hopefully you can see that there. You, mm -hmm. can, you can start breaking down within analytics in terms of male to female splits, uh, age range splits. You can then go further and if I stop sharing, and load up another one in a second, you can then go into their kind of in interests, which is super interesting. But as we say, to start with, so if anyone's listening and thinking, oh, this is amazing, but where do I start? Yes, to start with, you, you kind of start writing the story, but actually as your brand evolves and you start to gain traction, then you can kind of adapt that story and turn it really from fiction to non-fiction. Totally. In terms of here was a hunch, well, now we can back it up with data and this is actually the real persona going forwards. Mm. Fine. In terms of uh, looking at the right message, right medium, right time, I guess you, you do a lot of work on Facebook. In terms of right message, of course, the, everyone will understand that what you put on Twitter or Instagram or LinkedIn or whatever might be different to Facebook. Mm. How do you find the kind of times are affected? Is that something you've experienced in terms of actually posting at this time of day gets far more traction than this time of day? Or does it purely depend on sector? It's my favourite kind of question. I, I am going to make a hat. You know Trump's got his red Make America Great Again. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to have a hat like that that says it, it depends. And I'm just going to whop it on for these because I get this kind of question all the time. The, the most common question, you know, it's like, what's the right content to post for me? What's the right time? How often should I post? How long should a post be? And that's when I put on my it depends hat. Um, because it depends on your brand and it depends on your users. So if you are posting to Facebook, for example, and you've been doing that for a year, likely you have data when your audience are on. So if you go and look in insights, it's going to tell you when your audience are on. Don't fall foul of the time zone thing though. If you're going to go and look at your audience insights, make sure that you're looking at the right time zone because uh, otherwise you might start putting content out in the middle of the night because it's on Pacific Standard Time. Um, so if you have existing audience, you've got that data. If you don't have existing audience, then again, you are going to have to take a flyer. And how you take the flyer is when you write your user persona, I, I'm a mum, so I write a lot of user personas about mums because I know how mums use social. Um, mums for through it, Rebecca. It's really boring. Um, mums, <laughs> mums are. Let's just really, sell it to mums. In which case, we really need to know, right? They're really busy all day, and they might have a quick look at something. But it's generally while someone's going, mum, 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 especially at the moment. 
there's no, you know, I'm not going to read a Facebook post that's 15 paragraphs. It's no blinking way because I don't have 15 paragraphs worth of attention. And also for a completely new to me brand, I'm not going to give someone that much of my time. I can't. I haven't got time. I'm a mum that runs her own business. But after 9 p.m., I'm on my sofa drinking my wine and trying not to fall asleep in front of whatever TV program it is I've chosen to fall asleep in front of tonight. And I, I'm dual screening. So that's the time to show me your slightly longer post where you need a bit more of my attention. Um, so we know that in general, if you're going to take a sweeping generalization, mums are going to be online more in the evening. Mums with tiny babies are probably going to be online all night because they'll be awake and feeding. So there's a lot of opportunity for targeting mums with tiny ones in the middle of the night. Um, but again, it's about you write your avatar. You say this woman has a two year old. So and the two year olds at home. So she's running around all day. So she might only really be available to my at nine till 11 p.m. And don't ask her for much brain and just immediately solve a problem for her. And what you do is you, you write that persona, you really kind of stand in her shoes and then you test that. So you put your posts out at just before 9 p.m. and then you see how they pick up. And what you might find over time is actually more of your audience, it's more like 10, but you've got to, you've got to be putting the content out to get the data back to make the decision on the basis of and to continually test and refine. So that's where the user persona is so important because that's your initial assumption. So let's take that, let's take that mum's example a little bit further. Uh, again, if anyone's listening and kind of, uh, yeah, their persona is around mums and this is kind of a load of amazing content for you, but actually you can extrapolate <laughs> depend on what industry you're in. So I'm interested to see how do we demonstrate to mums that we really care? I get the, the message, but of course, for, to a standard mum, I don't think they would appreciate that you've tailored your message to go out at 902. Like we're showing yeah. great care by yeah. doing that, but that should be mum, seamless. Yeah, yeah, she doesn't see that. So how do we show her that we really care and understand her pain points? Because I'm sure, uh, again, not being a mum, I can't speak from example, but I'm sure that a lot of the time they feel like no one really understands their challenges or pain points. So does that come across in the copy or is it in Sometimes. the avatar? Like, how does that work? Sometimes I think it depends on the brand and there's a hugely different uh, tolerance to how overt you are about this between here and for example the US so there are a million books out there written in the US that are like you need to talk to you need to say knackered mums we see you we see you we know how you feel we know you've gone and shut yourself in the loo for five minutes so you can read this post you know we we know that you know you're about to throw yourself down the stairs whatever it is you can talk directly to people like that particularly on social that di but I, my, my personal feeling is that the American audience are slightly more tolerant of that direct call out than the English audience are. Sometimes I think, I think we, you know, you can do some of that direct call out, especially in ads. I feel like in Facebook ads, I'm more likely to start a post with a question or a direct call out like that, where I say, you know, Bristol mums. Have you had enough of your children? Come and leave them in my field for the day and I'll throw Lego at them or whatever, you know, whatever yeah, the yeah. proposition is. Whereas um, in your kind of day-to-day -day posting, you might not call out as directly, but there's a lot of calling out that you can use in posts where you're calling out people directly like that. I think once you've done, the thing I love about a user persona is once you've done a user persona, all your other marketing decisions, it's like Dungeons and Dragons. It's like once you've done the user persona, all the decisions are made for you because they all drop out from the user persona. Which platforms do I use? Well, where, where does your user persona hang out? What tone of voice do I use? Well, what's my business? What's my tone and how I present as a business? But also what tone of voice will my audience respond to? I feel like I need my Venn diagram now. I have this Venn diagram when I talk about content which is about um, the, what your kind of area of operation is as a business and then what your audience are interested in. And it's your social content is, is the intersection between the two. <laughs> it's that, it's that, that bit I'm peering through like a complete nutter. That is your ideal social content. Um, you know, certainly on social, knackered mums aren't gonna respond to buy our cheese for, you know, they're not going to respond to being sold to directly what they're probably going to respond to something 
hungry at night <laughs> yeah hungry at night or oh my gosh <laughs> somebody was um this was about this is a slightly different thing this is influencer marketing somebody had positioned their content with a, a very high profile woman who's just had a baby through a surrogate and i would have sold a kidney for this product at the time that my children were babies i, I genuinely would have paid any money that it, if it had been a ten thousand pound bassinet i'd bought it just to get a full night's sleep because when you when you're in that point you're knackered if somebody had said this product is available i'd have been submitting the form before you would said it's 1 a.m and you put the wrong credit card details in because you're delirious and and that's you know the avatar the user persona that's what it's going to allow you to do is i always think of it because i'm specky as then your user persona your avatar you're always making decisions through that lens i'm gone from this decision making process now it's all it. about the lens of the audience that's what you're going to look through when you look at content when you're writing copy for a post and you're going would i say cool here or would i say fab then you're looking through your lens all the time so that your the messages that you put out the tone you put them out in where you put them out the kind of calls to actions that you use, how directly you call your audience out or don't, is all, all comes through this filter. And that's especially important if that filter is really different to you as an individual. So before we step into the shoes of the customer and start looking at where they hang out and everything else, I just wanted to touch upon a, uh, like affinity audiences, if you like. So the kind of, oh, okay, like Eloise so, so perfectly pointed out earlier, people that have bought this also bought this. It would be interesting to see, I know certainly with analytics, again, this is one of our clients I was looking at earlier, you can see the kind of affinity categories within analytics. And I guess you can do the same through socials as well to say, okay, they may be interested in this, but what else are they interested in? So we can build up a thing. Where do you find that on analytics, Nathan? Is that on yeah, the analytics side? down the left hand side, there's an audience tab and then under there you can go into demographics. Uh, so age, um, location, you can then start looking at interests. Uh, again, it's, it's free to do. You just got to set it up. So many times I, I go into an analytics platform and I look at it and it's just not been turned on and I'm pulling my hair out and I just think, that is like such an easy win. Just mm. check it's turned on. Gold data. Yeah, exactly. Like that's, that's You use analytics. that type of data, Rebecca, to, um, to do your user personas if, they're, if you're working with a company that has that stuff. Yeah. Because that's going to have to be part of it. You were saying you're working on a hunch, but that's if really there's no data. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll be pulling all of this stuff in from Facebook, from Google. To, or a, degree. to a degree. And but again, and this is why I, one of my many soapboxes is why you never ask your mates to follow your Facebook page. Because for me, that's going to queer all your data going forward. Unless, of course, all your mates are your exact user persona. And you don't know that unless you've done your user persona. So you've got to do your user persona. Um, and even actually, even when you're, well, less so if your mates are your user persona then you know you're going to be ge generating representative data but yeah facebook insights there's a huge amount of detail in there about what the people who follow you are interested in so talking about the lens and getting into the shoes of the customer one bold statement that i'm prepared to say i think <laughs> is that actually some brands are too close to their business that they really struggle to distance themselves from the brand itself they just keep bringing it back to oh well i don't like that post or oh that doesn't look right on that instagram feed but it's not about you just stop totally. thinking about you for two seconds let's make the statement like bolder make the statement bolder all brands all brands i can't look at my proposition in fact my proposition i find impossible to market because it's me um, and even though I've been doing this for 25 years and I'm, I'm moderately good at it. You need it, a marketer. I need a marketer and I often will bounce my marketing of people in my, in my mastermind who are marketers because I just need someone else to look at it dispassionately. Yeah. And almost no business can look at their own offering. I mean, it, software is hilarious for this because software for so many years is probably different now. I've been out of software for five years, but I did 20 years in software and I would say there was never an industry that was worse at this than software because they were totally tech driven. They were totally like innovation driven and not market driven. So, you know, the techies would come in and say, we've made this tungsten under thruster spin. And I'm like, that's great. Um, why? And they'd say, cause we can. And I'm like, great. So why would the customer care? And they're like, because it's a spinning and tungsten under thruster. And I'm like, but I, what's the benefit of it? 
it's it's a spinning tungsten under thruster and it's you know it was so driven by we can make this technology and we can make it do things that nobody was then asking why and why would the audience care um i don't i think most businesses it's very hard to have that external view again if you don't do user centers. Is this what you call the self-reference bias? Yes, that is totally what I call the self-reference bias. So what self self-reference bias is a psychological concept. And what it means is you are more likely to retain or remember information that is to do with you. But in this context, and there are lots of really long studies on this, what it's also about is your tendency to make decisions in your marketing and everybody does this based on what you like where you hang out what you think is important so most brands i've worked with where i've done branding end up blue because i like blue um so there's a lot of turquoise you know because i like turquoise so i'm going to pick turquoise um if somebody said why is it turquoise what you know does turquoise sell more of this i wouldn't be able to defend it because it doesn't it's just because i like turquoise um and I have sat in rooms with marketers who've been marketers for 20 years, who've marketed massive brands, handled huge budgets, and are paid criminal amounts of money, who cannot take themselves out of the equation, who can't go, actually, I'm not. This, the target market for this is techies who work in a bunker. I'm, I'm a marketing director who speaks on stages a lot. Actually, I'm not indicative of the audience, so it doesn't matter that I like it. It's you know, because we're not thinking about the actual audience here. And that's, that's when I talk about self-reference bias in relation to marketing, that's what I mean is you, we have to, our job as marketers is to completely take ourselves out of the decision-making It's it, in a way. And that feels really like I would a crazy like to thing to do. I would like to contribute something on that because that really resonates with me. Obviously, I'm, my company helps people sell on Amazon. We're interested in selling on Amazon. I speak to a lot of brands that say, well, Amazon isn't for us. It's not really premium enough for us. It's very, very mass market. And then we find out that everybody at the company shops on Amazon. And I'm like, okay, if <laughs> everybody in this 50-man company shops on Amazon, who in there is definitely not indicative of your target audience? And it, you know, people love to buy on Amazon. They love your products. But it's one of those things that we see ourselves as X, and but actually the reality is everybody knows what you can or can't sell on there but it's that type of thing that we we don't think that we're really like that but in fact that you're not representative of who's actually buying your stuff mm. and I, I think it's sometimes so as an example one of the first the the example i gave you of the travel the travel company so it's the first time i did use personas and it was for a brand who do yoga tours in Iceland. Absolutely gorgeous brand. I love Iceland. I love yoga. Was super excited to get them as a client. And one of the first things I, I really, I, I literally had Cynthia, Helena and Penny pictures. I found pictures and put them, and I had them up on, on the board behind my laptop because, because I like Iceland and yoga, the tent, it was really risky that I was just going to pick all the kind of yoga content that resonated with me. But the kind of yoga that these women did was totally different. It was a, I don't want to go into detailed yoga, but it was a totally different form of yoga. Um, and they were very different kinds of women to me. So I needed to take myself away from it. Even though I'm enthusiastic about those topics, I needed to take myself out of it in order to be able to make decisions and put out content that was going to resonate with the women that we wanted to reach and was going to tell them immediately, this thing is for you. One of the biggest challenges I see with putting yourself into the other person's shoes is the content creation piece versus curation and, and what to say. And for us, again, if I just quickly share this tab, we use a, a service called Google Alerts, and I don't know yep. if you use it as well. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Yeah, fine. So we use Google Alerts where we can just tag different alerts. And then essentially, so if I want to find something about hospitality, again, every day into my inbox, different emails about hospitality come in so I can make sure I've got my finger on the pulse. I'd advocate anyone doing that in their line of work so they can absolutely be at the forefront of their industry and see what's going on. Additionally, Google Trends is, is super interesting because we just start to see, okay, what is actually the world thinking and how are they behaving? And if you want to go from real-time search trends through to daily search trends, again, just looking at today's, it's fascinating to see the, the, kind, of, uh, yeah, the kind of news going out there and the, the content out there. And then the final piece and little plug would be around this Think With Google tool. Again, all the hard work is kind of done for us, but I sometimes find in the world of digital, it's about uh, almost signposting people towards the right tools. 
you don't have to necessarily start from scratch. A lot of that aggregation, which in for the past would have taken days and days and days, has is, is kind of all been done for us. But now mm. we just need to make people aware of that and say, actually, there's loads of tools here. Loads so what do you think with Google Earth then, Nate, what is it? But what one? Think with Google? Yeah. So Think with Google is a platform that essentially promotes different insights and ideas and tools. So it's like the, the umbrella uh, setup, if you like. And then underneath it, it signposts you to lots of different tools and products, as you can see here. For example, competitive analysis, consumer insights, diagnostics and industry benchmarks. We can then start to really understand our industry. And by understanding our industry, we then better understand our personas, which then means we can make our, our content as relevant as possible. Mm. But then it almost feel like we're talking to them. There is nothing, certainly in our line of work, there is nothing that converts better than when you feel like it's a one-to-one -one conversation. Of course, you're, you're talking to more than one person. But if you can really go, God, that, that really got me, that you really feel like you've hit the nail on the head there, then of mm. course people can, can convert, right? Because you resonate with them. And that's Completely. the thing. So I'd advocate anyone to look at Google Trends, Google Alerts, keep your finger on the pulse. And then start having a look at this uh, thing with Google digital toolbox to start seeing what tools are available and how you can start to really understand and get into the shoes of your customers. Let's not just have it as a saying, oh, we, we need to get in the shoes of our customer. No, let's physically get in those shoes and let's understand it a bit better. Mm. So going from getting into the shoes, we then move on more to around defining the avatars. And I always talk to people around, let's stop just spray and pray and this whole throw it at the wall and see what sticks. Let's actually get out the sniper rifle and start picking off our targets a bit more selectively. How do you help your clients to do that, Rebecca? I guess in, in the B2B world and B2C, it's still exactly the same, right? We need one person, not hundreds of people. We just need one person. What I tend to do, um, so again, start with a macro. You know, What are the groups that you tend to talk about? The kinds of people, the types of people, the, the board groups and then see if you can pull people out from under that. And as an example, I had a client who, they were ex-BBC script writers, and what they did was to sell wedding speeches, which was, I was, it was a new market for me, not one I'd come across. Um, and they were very, very, one of the first things we did was define all their possible audiences. So not in a huge amount of detail, but quite broad terms. Who were the, the use cases? What were all the possible use cases for buying a wedding speech that somebody had written for you? And they were very, very excited personally about the opportunities presented by things like same-sex marriages, where you might get both people in a couple speaking. And actually, I hear that's much more common these days to have both the bride and groom speak and various other people within the wedding party speak. But although we defined all these use cases, where the cluster was, when we looked at their goals as a business and what they needed to do, which was grow awareness very fast, it made sense to go for the, sorry to use the buzzword, the, the low-hanging fruit, the classic audience, which for them was the men. So grooms, uh, best men, and fathers of the bride, because that's pretty much, you know, they wear a suit, they give a speech, that's what they do at weddings. They're your kind of... They're your low hanging fruit. So the first campaign you did to make a speech, right? Yeah, th that's what they have to do. Wear a suit, make a speech. Nobody else has to make a speech. Um, so those were the three that we picked picked off first because we knew that they would we'd get traction with them fastest and we'd move towards their goals as a business fastest. And so those were the three that we then fleshed out as user personas. So we defined a man for each group based on a, a man that they either knew or had worked with before, you know, we have, like, I can't remember the names there, but like John, Paul, Ben, groom, father of the bride, best man, use case. And then we started to fill in the detail. So the kind of demographic detail around, I, I always give them a name and sometimes that name will be an actual person's name. And sometimes it will be a label like Waitrose mum or, uh, small business MD or something like that but because when you're discussing them with other people it helps if you have a label um, how old they are where they are physically in the country what their living circumstances are so are they married themselves do they have kids how old are their kids who do they live with um, do they own their own home and then into or does it depend on the brand to go that granular for some you know 
it's just getting a sense of the kind of people that they are for one for one client you know that all three of their eps were definitely homeowners they were probably homeowners that paid off their mortgages as well um you know and they had a bit of disposable income to spend on the thing that that particular brand sold i i think it's whatever the the kind of level of detail is a bit of a gut feel thing because it's whatever detail makes that person feel real and like someone you could meet and have a conversation with because if you wanted to get really woo woo about it when you're then making marketing decisions you can imagine you're having a conversation with that person <laughs> and that's easier to do if you kind of know them really well um and certainly on the bc side we might go that detailed on it um on the b2b side it's a bit different because obviously you're dealing with somebody with their work hat on. So the level of detail that you put into the user persona is about them in their professional lives. So I would always include some personal detail to round them out just so that they feel more three dimensional. But the majority of the detail that I put in a user persona for a B2B sale would be their, their professional in interests, the information sources that they go to to get information about their jobs, um, what their pain points are, within their jobs, why, you know, why in their role at work, more about their kind of role at work, their reporting lines, whether they have decision-making um, responsibility or not, and then why they might engage with your brand and why they might not engage with your brand. And all of this so, is available, right, within the, the various platforms, uh, whether it be natively within social or within analytics or whatever, a lot of this stuff is accessible. So we can- Some of it is. Some of it is, but, but again, you know, when I do this and when I do this with clients, I'm doing it as a fictional exercise very often. Very often we're doing it on no data. So we're, we're making it up, literally. And then testing. And then testing. Because if you're going from ground zero, you might have no data and then you have to take a flyer. And it is better to take a flyer while focusing on a person than take a flyer based on your own opinion if, if you're not the target market. But presumably, if you've, if you've already got some traction in your company or your, your kind of remarketing products you know about, you could go and ask some of it, depending on what you're selling, you could go ask, ask some of your favorite customers. You're like, some of my kids. clients do that. Um, <laughs> email, the people that like respond to all your email marketing and like buy extra, you could go and do that, right? That's I, had, I had one client who actually went to their database and emailed three people and made them fill in a questionnaire. And when they came back and told me, it was really funny because they came back and told me and they were like, we've done this thing, we did this extra piece of research. And I was like, oh my gosh, what must the customer have thought? But, um, but you know, the date and it's another great thing about social is if you've got an audience, you can go and ask them what they like a lot of the time. So- or something and people love to participate. Yeah, what do you, what do you want to see more of in our content? But you can do that once you've got the audience. When you haven't got the audience, you've got to make assumptions. One of the main frustrations I come across is those people that they don't have a massive budget yet. Um, we try and just be all things to all people and we spread it so thinly that you can't possibly get any sensible data out the back of it because you're, you're spending like 50p per audience type and then you wonder why we, we can't make any decisions. So yeah, I think if you're going to take anything from that section, it would be to make sure that you really... Um, kind of hang your colors to the mask, go down that this is exactly the person we're going to go after. Let's make it super specific, whether it be the content, whether it be the times, whether it be the platform, uh, whatever it's going to be, and, and then make sure that the budget is allocated accordingly, mm. rather than trying to please all people. And you actually, can't, you can't. Or you risk being Julia Roberts in that scene at the beginning of Pretty Woman where Richard Gere asks her what her name is and she says, what do you want it to be? And it's like, I've had, a, you know, I had this huge argument with a sales director once who was like, we mustn't cut anyone off in this targeting that you're doing. We mustn't turn anyone off. And I'm like, but we risk not turning anyone on at all. And we, there's no reason that you can't, you know, do campaigns that folks, so say you define 15 avatars, can't see who would, but you've got 15 avatars and they cluster, you know, you can run a campaign to one and then you can run a campaign to another cluster, and then you can run a campaign to another cluster. No one is paying so much attention to your marketing. This is a bit of a brutal thing to say, but it's true. No one is paying so much attention to your marketing that they go, hang on a minute, last week they were targeting mums, and this week they're targeting dads. Who are they? They're schizophrenic. I'm not gonna buy from them. No one cares. The audience don't care that much about your, they don't care as much about your marketing as you do, that, that that's gonna bother them. 
what will bother them is if you don't speak directly to them at some point. That's, you know. a, brilliant, that's a brilliant challenge. And I mean, just before we dive on to the last part of today's show, I, um, and in that session, we're going to do a live exercise. And actually, there's one particular um, attendee that's been on quite a few of these uh, webinars, and she's been a great supporter of it. And so I'd love to, to kind of do a live example on her brand so we can give her a bit of avatar feedback. But actually, before we dive into that, I just want to go in terms of, yeah, a little bit around the 80-20 rule and how actually we need to make sure that the audience we're going after, once we've kind of got some data, we then start looking at other audiences because the audience you create isn't the only audience out there, right? And again, that's one thing we really must cover off is that's great. You've got to be laser focused, but don't be laser focused and then never realign your sites to go again. Just mm -hmm. keep bang, 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 like eventually you're going to have to take stock, take a step back and then go after a different set of targets. Mm. And I think it's particularly important in B2B where you're likely to have, depending on the ticket of the sale, you know, in some of the big, bigger ticket business to business sales processes, you, you might well have several decision makers. So a prospect I was talking to last week in their micro generation, energy generation, and they might have about seven or eight people involved in a sale. And so that kind of, and they'll be from very, very different functions within the organization. So they need to make sure they're kind of covering off all those kind of elements of the decision-making unit, which is a, a whole other problem for another time. But um, I, I, I suppose with B2B, you've got, you're likely to have more people involved in a decision than in B2C where you're just selling one person a pair of socks quite quickly. For sure. Now, just quickly on that note of B2B, I appreciate that a lot of these targeting options are available to B2C as well. But again, this is LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Hopefully you can see that. But the kind of level of targeting you can go into is absolutely phenomenal in terms of, uh, yeah, the relationship you've got with them, the industry they're in, their name, their geography, the seniority level. Uh, I mean, it goes into income, company headcount. It's ridiculous. And this just shows you that absolutely there are no more excuses to spray and pray. Certainly not if you're today. That uh, the days of spray and pray are gone, my friends. You mm. need to be a lot more laser focused and hopefully this will help you to do that. So Sales Navigator is a great one. Quickly on the, just on B2B, I appreciate this isn't so relevant in B2C, but it's around sequencing. And actually it's not just a case of always just one message and then you never talk to that audience type again. Sometimes the first message won't hit the target, just like our sniper rifle example. Yes, you're going to be closer to the mark, but if you blink, uh, move, whatever, flinch, you may miss the target. So how can we essentially create a sequence that means you can uh, build kind of trust and, and, and um, yeah, and content over time. And the final little tip was around crystal nose. And I don't know if either of you ladies use this, but crystal nose allows us to take our understanding of somebody to the next level. And I think it's is such a great app. I absolutely love it. And just very quickly, um, because I'm really keen to go into this live example, but I will show you how weirdly effective it is. So it works as a LinkedIn extension, right? And if I can quickly find it on my desktop, where did I put it? I had a, um, yeah, I loaded up mine earlier and it's scarily accurate, like weirdly so. And I, I, I just advocate you all just get a free trial or whatever and have a go. Nathan's going to spill the beans here, but uh, to... here we go. So this is, this is my profile. It reads my LinkedIn, it reads my email, it understands what I, uh, what I like. And it talks about what comes naturally to me. And uh, uh, the amount of times we've talked about goal setting on this, it comes as no surprise that goals are really important to me. <laughs> what energizes me. Uh, and yeah, the fact I talk so much, I guess taking charge makes perfect sense. In terms of what drains me, people just being really slow and everything else. So I think it's really important as well that the deep research analysis, this is why we hire a data Cyber department. Cyber marketing, right? Yeah, we have a data department in-house because this stuff isn't, uh, I, I like the top level stuff actually getting under it. I know the importance, but it's, it's not my bag. Um, but yeah, what to do when speaking with me, when you're in meetings with me, when emailing me, how to convince me. I'll breeze over that so nobody sees. Uh, how, to <laughs> me, how to provide feedback, uh, heads up and rubs for feedback. Uh, but it's really important to get it. So yeah, challenging me with intensity is always good. I, I just think it's an amazing tool and something you can take your user personas to the next level if you can start to understand, again, just before pitches, we've used it. And we've said, actually, if we're going to go into this audience, we need to make sure that they're, we absolutely resonate with them. So how can we really understand what energizes them and what's going to drain them? So, uh, yeah, worth having a look at that. Wow. 
So final thing was around this, uh, yeah, this live exercise. And I'm really keen, like I say, we've got, let me just share this again. We've had some brilliant um, kind of attendees on the show for the last few weeks. And actually, this is the last part of this series before in June we move on to another series. And we've got some new webinars that are coming out every Thursday in June. And we'll get to those towards the end. But today, there's, there's one lady that's attended quite a few and always been a quite a big ambassador of the show. And so I was keen if we can use her as a live example. She sells women's underwear. And I'm hoping that, yeah, you'll understand that market far better than I do. So, <laughs> Yeah, again, I created this uh, for us when we're doing it, and this might be different for B2C, and I welcome your feedback, but I look at their location, uh, I look at their demographic profile, and this actually came from a, a great friend of mine, a sales trainer, Matt Sykes, at, over at Sales Cadence. Um, but yeah, we look at the demographic profiles, the psychographic profiles, we then narrow it down as we talked about, one person, one business, the three big problems, and then how we solve them. So perhaps we can take this female underwear brand. If I come to you, and I'm now running that company, Let's go. How can, we, um, how can we start? We have about five to six minutes. What can we do to help create our avatar? Okay. So the, I think the first thing, once you've got that, the broad dem demographic, so what's, her general, what's the general age range she sells to? Good question. I'd say maybe 25 to 35. 25 to 35. So, okay. Um, and is it functional is it <laughs> there's no way of talking about this without getting into um it's okay. it's value judgment so, so, well, is it well is it sort you know is it it's not nice the function of the underwear oh, is it to nice be attractive or is it comfort or is it sport or is it shapewear oh it's a very good question i really <laughs> I do believe it's more around it's more around it, attraction. Is that is they're nice underwear. I wouldn't say it's it's necessarily for comfort. It's certainly for a younger demographic that's really conscious about what they're wearing and they're looking good. Okay, good. Um, so, and what's the price point? Uh, the price point. They work on a really interesting subscription model as well, but the price point is is not expensive at all. You look at the competitors, whether it be lounge underwear or some of those bigger players. Um, they're they're much more cost effective than that. Okay, so more than M&S, but less than Agent Provocateur. I think that's a, a lovely way of putting it, yeah. <laughs> Okie dokie. And what is their, where do they believe their USP is? What's their, what's their, their USP? What do they think it is that they're doing that now is different? You're <laughs> So I think, uh, interestingly, the way in which they sell their products is quite interesting. Like I said, they go subscription rather than one-off. Um, the range is in which they sell a slightly different to most. I believe there's something to do with the shape. Don't quote me on that, but that seems like a logical thing. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say they're their they're cool USPs. And actually, no, it's, it's about, because the, the way that they sell, I think that's hard to pull a UP on. But if they, for example, if it's down to this underwear, you know, you can get something in this, you know, I don't, I don't think there are women out there going, I must have pants that nobody else has. Um, because, you know, my <laughs> kind of people who are going to see my pants don't want to see me in the same pants as anybody else. I mean, obviously not literally the same pants as anybody else, but um, just having that, that, you know, not wanting to have a generic look, you know, wanting, you know, and I, I think that's probably common for most women is that, that you, you want to look good. And wearing this to feel special and unique yeah. and yeah, and, and feel good about themselves. I think that's the big thing around female empowerment and confidence in their body shape uh, when they're wearing this underwear. So I think what I'd be doing is with the business, getting them to, and a lot of, I think a lot of businesses, I know Sweaty Betty have got a really good, um, or they certainly used to have, and they were a really good example of somebody who lost the plot on their avatar. Because when they started out as a business, they had a really clear idea of their avatar. She was called Kate. Um, and it was basically me and my sister who was actually called Kate. And we both used to buy a lot from them. And then they lost sight of their avatar and it all got a bit, they, they sort of lost the plot that what they were selling was really nice exercise gear that lasted really well, that you looked okay in. And they started talking their marketing messaging about, you know, looking sexy while you were doing while you were in the gym and they pissed a lot of us off because that's not why we were in the gym and we just wanted decent leggings that weren't going to win um and i suppose for their age group 
when they're defining their avatar, they want to look for somebody who's got the disposable income to be buying regularly, especially on a subscription model, because I don't know about you, Eloise, but, you know, there's an overshare. I probably only buy new underwear when it falls to bits, because... <laughs> Like my children are growing like weeds, so they need a new underwear a lot. Model for, your underwear, for kids with kids' underwear, right? That would be more your demographic. Yeah, but. totally. Because it's, it's blinking socks, which seem to disappear somewhere in this house. <laughs> but like, if you know, think of me when I was 20, between twenty-five and thirty-five. You want something exciting you can try out? Yeah, or month. you know, it's payday. I might buy myself a nice little something. You know, I still cared about looking attractive then. Um, you know, I, I might have gone and bought myself some knickers um, or whatever in sets as well because of that whole thing. What if I get run over by a bus and I'm not wearing matching underwear? These days, I'd be like, I literally don't care. I literally, <laughs> worst thing, I'm 45. I had two brutal cesarean sections. I literally <laughs> don't care what I'm wearing when I get run over by a bus. But when I was 25, I would have been, you know, Probably the worst thing I could have think, thought of then, being the princess that I was, was if I get hit by a bus and my pants and my bra don't match. <laughs> so that kind of looking for somebody who's got the disposable income, who, to whom looking good and probably treating themselves, that's probably a, a strand that I would pull in content is the like hashtag treat yourself, um, you know, and underwear our self care. Um, and what's the, you know, what's the problem with this woman's underwear? What is it that's not working for her about going to M&S and buying Rosie Huntington Whiteley's line in M&S that this brand is going to solve for her? And if it's harder to do than that, what are you going to do to get her over the line? So is it that it's going to come through her letterbox and she can send back anything she doesn't like? Is it that she's really super busy and she hasn't got time to go and trawl through a bigger store? Is it that she doesn't want to go somewhere where she's worried that the quality or it's going to be uncomfortable? She wants to look good, but it wants to be comfortable. Um, so I think, and, and I think this is why the avatar thing, the user persona thing does always need to be done at least in partnership or with the business. Cause I, I could chalk it up, but, you, you need, I think I, you I don't know what to, you need to see the product. Probably. I can see what you say about writing a novel because I know nothing about this and I certainly don't own an, own an underwear brand, but I'm getting really fascinated about what are the pain points of this woman. It is because you have the gift to start asking those questions that I would be going in a, I mean, like, what is, you know, you just have that instinctive. I, I think I do it because I am phenomenally nosy. And so all the things I used to get beaten up with, beaten up about at school, like I, I'm a lateral thinker, so I dart around all the time. I'm really, really nosy about other people's lives and I have ridiculously strong empathy, which tends to make me cry if somebody else is crying. Those are all the things you need to stand in someone's shoes and go. That's what amazing. That's what really makes somebody tick. I had someone in an interview once say to me, what psychology got to do with marketing? And I'm like, it's the science of motivation. If you understand someone's motivation, you can make them do anything. Um, you know, like buying underwear is relatively easy because that's, I buy some new underwear, I feel better about myself. I am happy. That's not that many logical steps to go up. Making somebody buy process mapping software, process mapping software to happy, that's a lot of steps to go up. So you probably need more detail for B2B, if anything, because you're taking someone on a longer journey than when you're just getting them to buy a band t-shirt or a Swedish hiking jacket or wine or something. I mean, that makes perfect sense. And I, um, well, I don't know about you, but I, well, I'm sure we could have chatted for hours, but I'm conscious of time. We've got some people who are kindly given up their time and, and we said we'd finish by one. So very quickly, Rebecca, firstly, thank you. Uh, and I dare say we might even uh, do another episode because that was, um, yeah, there's so many more things I'd love to ask. <laughs> so I'm led to believe that, well, first of all, we've got some upcoming webinars coming up. This, as I said, is the final episode of this series and we've been overwhelmed, Eloise and I, by the kind of feedback you've all given us and it's been fantastic. And so, so much so, we've actually got four new ones coming in June and hopefully some, some more interesting speakers joining us as well. They're going to be every Thursday, three till four. And Eloise and I will be sending out details via email, et cetera, to those. The, a little plug for what we said at the start around the free kind of audits we can get from both Eloise and I. And actually, Rebecca, I believe you were keen on offering a, a kind of a, a free worksheet or something that you'd Yeah, it's really, really, you know. Easy to use workshop that no one has except you. That yeah. They all show it up, Just put it up to the we all need just a one pager to work through. 
Perfect. That's perfect. I think, um, yeah, thank you all uh, for those that are joining us. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Eloise. I hope you've all enjoyed it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thanks again. Lovely, lovely chatting to you guys. Thank you so much for having me.